Welcome to the Kanban Coaching Exchange. It's good to see you all tonight. So welcome, welcome. Tonight, our guest speaker is Eva Mika. And I got to meet Eva when she was going through the Train the Trainer program. And boy, did she ace it. She's got so much knowledge about Kanban and she's now working as an accredited Kanban trainer. She does coaching, she does consultancy, and she's got so much experience to be able to share with us tonight. Um, so it was a no-brainer for me to get her along to share some of those great experiences. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Eva. Take it away. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, wow, that was very nice of you. Thank you for this. Um, Oh, a little bit blushing, maybe. Uh, <laughs> thank you for this introduction. Uh, what I would like to talk to you about today is basically what I do at the company I work for right now. And this is KMD. It's a technological company. And you should be able to see my screen in a minute. Yep. Is it working? Awesome. So um, basically, I will tell you the case study of our setup, uh, how we develop our product. And I will be jumping through our bigger system uh, with a different aspects uh, to show you how different Kanban practices can help us in different places, what we did and what was the result. But before I begin, I would like to start by showing you something. Uh, this is actually my cuts. Here you can see two of them. This is uh, one of them. I have three. And uh, I want to show you something that I was able to achieve with my cat. Yeah, so once again, if you missed it, yeah, the cat can give a high five if I ask her to. And uh, what I learned from this, this was actually uh, quite therapeutic for me because uh, I was uh, having a lot of stress and anxiety at work at that time, it was two years ago. Mm, and I was focusing on spending more time with my cats to like relieve the stress and I was training with them a lot. And uh, it actually gave me this feeling that if you want to achieve any change, uh, you need to be very patient and very persistent. Uh, how you train a cat to do things like that? Well, you have to just teach a cat. You cannot train it. You have to teach it. So you have to do it every day again and again and again and hope for the good behavior to appear. And whenever the cat, when I did like that and the cat answered with giving the high five, then it got praised. So I gave a treat and the cat was happy. And if uh, she missed my hand, then no treat for her. So uh, this was like repeated and repeated for a really long time before it actually started to working. Right now, I don't even need any treats to have this behavior in my cat. However, what it can tell us and what it told me and how I can use it in my work in daily life is that uh, for the evolutionary change, which is actually the basics of continuous improvement, we need to be persistent and patient. And we will see the results not one day from now, not one week from now, but we need to wait a couple of months, maybe even longer. So what I will be presenting uh, to you today uh, will also be a result of a longer journey. It's not a short term results. Okay, so jumping straight to the Kanban. I hope you all know more or less what Kanban is about. Like we are on the Kanban uh, coaching exchange meetup. So this is my assumption. However, if I'm mistaken, <laughs> no, I'm not mistaken. Kellen is, yeah, okay, thumbs up. That's awesome. So what you can see here is basically uh, how I became a Kanban coach. Does any one of you work uh, or worked before as a Kanban coach, like the specific work title? Not Agile coach, Kanban coach. Nope. Yeah. Uh, well, that's that's pretty uncommon. Uh, I know it's uncommon. And uh, we didn't have such position in the company before. Uh, but uh, at the end of the previous year, um, 22, Actually, at the end of 22, um, I was able to deliver such results with uh, one of the enablers teams in the setup. So uh, 
through nine months of journey with visualization, uh, limiting work in progress and measuring uh, their lead times and productivity in trying to make something out of their work and understand it, uh, they were able to achieve more than 100% increase in the throughput. Uh, so the delivery rate was also uh, pretty much higher and uh, satisfaction from the customers, from the management, uh, well, was much bigger also. So uh, with such results in one team, uh, when the management saw um, how we can improve uh, through time, uh, then they created the Kanban coach position so that I could do it with other teams as well. So um, this Kanban journey, this is actually up to date because the charts before were old. So this is how this team looks like right now. And I'm showing you this to, I don't know, maybe inspire you a little to take a look at the biggest time, bigger time frame than we usually do working in the agile setups uh, to see the uh, evolution of your team or your product. So this is how I became a Kanban coach. And right now I'm focusing in my job mostly on uh, processes and system improvements. Uh, I'm working for the energy solution department uh, in the KMD Elements product. And this product is, just to give you a heads up, it's from for the energy market. So like uh, probably uh, none of you are the target audience right now, but <laughs> I can give you some context uh, what I will be talking about. So uh, we are developing the product that uh, is shown on this roadmap right now on the slide and it has different market segments and for each market segment that it should serve the, the needs of this market segment we have separate modules for separate services uh, for the business and uh, what we actually do to develop such a big product because it's quite a big endeavor uh, this is the system that is actually taking care of all billing and calculations for the electricity um, however you use it so from the sources where it is created in the solar panels or wind farms uh, through the companies that are actually operating the flow of this energy and uh, till the end till the retail customers who are actually using and getting the bills for the energy they used so in order to take care of such a big uh, complex uh, solution uh, we are actually developing this product uh, in iterative and incremental approach, uh, mostly in Scrum teams. However, we are delivering parts of this roadmap, parts of these modules, as the projects run um, by Prince2 me method. And basically, MVP requirements for each customer are the uh, project scope. So it can be a couple of modules from one segment, it can be a couple of modules from different segments, like uh, the examples uh, I draw with different colors on this picture. And uh, when we are delivering the MVP requirements for a specific customer, and he's going on the production, then we can further give other functionalities and develop the solution further uh, with the incremental and iterative approach. For those of you who might not know uh, how um, we work with the software, the software development, um, this is like a very uh, simplified model. It's my drawing, so sorry, it's not so perfect, but I hope it will be sufficient. Uh, and uh, well, basically we have this development and uh, business uh, with processes are people who are developing uh, the product in the Scrum teams. So they are using this cyclical approach to create increments of the product uh, every two weeks. But then we also have uh, separately uh, customer and sales who are working with the business, but maybe not so much with development right now. Uh, we have customer service for the customers who are already using our solution. And we also have on this right bottom corner, the enabler teams. Uh, I call them enabler teams using the team topology nomenclature um, because those are the teams that are actually enabling the Scrum teams to develop the product. And platform team would be one of them. 
To be more specific, this is the entire setup. Uh, we have in this green circles the enabler teams, and they are using Kanban practices. They are using Kanban method, actually. And then we have this orange circles, which are the Scrum teams. As you can see, uh, as we have a lot of Scrum teams, right now we have 20 Scrum teams. <laughs> uh, they uh, have to group together uh, to the cooperate closer uh, in order to de develop some sort of goal uh, or the customer process that needs to be automated. So they are grouping around around goals in the so-called forums and they are handling dependencies on this forum level, like this bubble level. Uh, but then we have, of course, those green teams who are serving all of the bubbles and they are answering the requests uh, and providing services to all of the Scrum teams. Yes, we have a question. Hi, thank you. I hope it's OK um, that I can ask. Sure. Oh, lovely. Thank you. So this this looks amazing because this is this is looks like it's going to solve some issues that we've got with our setup at my organi organization. It's really interesting what you've done here. So the you've you've got scrum teams that are working on goals and and customers, whereas you've got QA integration architecture platforms. They kind of support the. Do they support the Scrum yes. teams? But they're in more of a Kanban because they're. I'm guessing because their um the priorities change much quicker. Is that why? Yes. Yes. Exactly. The priorities can change basically from hour to hour, and they also have unpredicted workload. Um, the Scrum teams can plan their work. We have some contract with customers for this MVP scope. We have reviews with the customers. We get the feedback. We know what are the requirements, more or less. Uh, however, those operational teams, those enabler teams, uh, they don't know what will happen tomorrow. So planning the iteration two weeks up front was really difficult for them. And this was one of the pains why they decided to abandon Scrum approach completely. That's the pain that we've got. Thank you so much for that. No problem. You also had another question, Eva, which is, do you have continuous delivery in the Scrum teams? Uh, that's a really good question. Well, we have uh, weekly deployments. Uh, I, I don't know if that answered the questions completely, um, but uh, yeah, we are trying to have it uh, on the, well, that, hmm. I would say uh, yes, however, not uh, with all the integrations because that depends on the environment. So we have weekly uh, deployments on higher environments when we can actually test all of the dependencies and all of the uh, integrations with other teams. Thank you, Eva. That Thanks for the, for the answer. Mm -hmm. Another question? Hi, um, it's Mark here. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that you have te some teams using Prince 2. Why are they using Prince 2? Um, the, well, many of our customers uh, in general in KMD are from the public sector. Um, KMD used to be a public company in Denmark uh, that were providing the solution for the Danish government, uh, etc. Uh, right now they are a private company and we have private customers also. However, um, the, just the bidding law in Denmark for the projects that were for the government needed to be handled by Prince2. Therefore, the entire organization just took it as the method to run projects. And even in our situation, when we are doing the innovative product that is not on the market yet, like we are the first one to introduce such a solution on this big scale for the energy market. So even then, the contracts with the customers are done the same way as the entire company operates. And, and one follow-up question: Why are the QAs sitting outside of the teams? Um, you know, you know. Normally, you want to, you know, you want a cross-functional team. Um, mm -hmm. Wouldn't you want them to be closer to the teams? Um, you know, rather than sitting outside of the teams. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question, uh, and the answer for it will even come in the later slides because that all depends how you understand the QA team. 
We have testers in the uh, Scrum teams, uh, actually quality assurance engineers who are doing both manual and automated tests uh, in order to provide quality to the Scrum team. They are also teaching the developers to, for example, you know, take care of their code, do some basic tests themselves, <laughs> things like that. So our Scrum teams are actually quite mature in agile adoption, which was very surprising for me when I joined the setup for the first time three years ago. Uh, but uh, the QA team in this meaning, like this external team, consists of uh, a little bit different uh, specialists. For example, uh, one of the QA team members is our release manager. One of the QA team members is our QA architect who is actually uh, supporting the uh, tools and framework for our automated tests uh, suit. Uh, we also have in, uh, the QA coordinator in the QA team who is helping to coordinate the bigger testing efforts, for example, uh, through the entire goal, the entire customer flow, when we have the whole bubble of Scrum teams and they need to you know, test the process, the customer process end to end, what all of those teams did together. Uh, and then all of the testers from those teams are engaged in those efforts. However, the QA coordinator from QA team is actually the one who is taking care of the you know, organizational aspects. Um, and uh, so like QA team also consists of two QA specialists, QA engineers, who are like the, let's say, hmm, bench uh, support uh, that are there because if we have one QA engineer in each Scrum team, then we have bus factor one. So, you know, any sick leave, any vacation, and the Scrum team might have an issue. Uh, that's why they can also reach out to QA team and say, hey, our uh, QA specialist is getting uh, on a vacation for one month. We would need some support because we have some big functionality and we cannot do it by ourselves. We need some tester support. And then QA team is giving this person to, to help them. Thank you. Hmm? Okay. Um, as I can see, there's a lot of questions uh, uh, also about the stuff I will be talking in the couple of slides. So I'm really excited that you want to listen about what I have to say. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, maybe let's move on for now. And uh, uh, right now I would like to uh, describe to you how we actually expanded. So what you see here is this situation like for today. What does the setup look like today? And uh, it changed through time. Um, we tried many different approaches. We tried to split to two different guilds. We tried to, uh, you know, um, this is the effect of the evolutionary change that took more than a year. And this grouping with the teams that are ser the servi serving all the other teams is something we found out to be working best after trial and error. Uh, so I would strongly encourage you to uh, try to find also your own solution, not uh, not exactly maybe copy the same, but try to uh, try to take something from it and make it your own. And yeah, how it happened. So when we started in 2019, uh, we had the first year of the development. Uh, we had zero customers using our product on the production environment. So it was like this happy development time. Everyone where every developer could do whatever they liked. They thought about new methods, new uh, the technology they could use. Everyone was happy. Free scrum teams, free enabling teams, architects team, which were basically advisors for developers in terms of architecture and uh, entire product, so like cross team infrastructure. Uh, and we had ETL, which is migration team, uh, and QA, which were basically supporting the uh, cross team testing and supporting the testers in the Scrum team. We had around 40 people in the product back then. Then in 2021, uh, we had six Scrum teams already with still three enabling teams and around 60, 70 people with first customer starting using our solution. So for the first year, we developed this uh, MVP functionalities for the first customer. And now we have the customer that is giving real feedback and is having later functionalities developed incrementally. 
Next year, we have nine Scrum teams, four enabling teams, because the platform team was born. Uh, and we also signed a big contract for the biggest customer from new market segment. DSO is actually distribution system operator in the energy market. And this is one of the biggest uh, um, sectors for our product. So that was a huge success and also a huge recruitment endeavor because we needed to recruit a lot of people fast uh, because the scope was very big. So. Um, this also created the need to create a platform team as a separate team, because until that time, every Scrum team had the responsibility to deploy their own code and to release their own code. And they did everything by themselves. However, when we started to recruit new people and it was more and more teams uh, and uh, a lot of new teams were not used to our ways of working yet, um, and there were, well, let's put it plain, uh, trust issues that some teams might not be able to do it correctly. And as we already had a customer uh, that was using our solution on the production, uh, there was a need to create from those teams, those Scrum teams, uh, like three people, I believe, from the start. Right now, there are six of them uh, were chosen as, as those uh, DevOps platform engineers that will be taking care of the developing the platform, taking care of the infrastructure and pipelines and uh, actually uh, deployments to the higher environments. And now we have 100 people in the setup. Uh, as we won this big contract, we had to recruit even more people. So in uh, 23, we already had 11 Scrum teams. We had six enabling teams because other than a uh, platform team, there were the need to create two additional teams. Shell team, which was the team that took care of unification of UI in our product. Because soon when we grew this fast, soon we found out that when we have 10 Scrum teams, then sometimes similar functionalities might not look the same in the UI. <laughs> so we needed to do something about it. And we have this special like task force team uh, to take care of it. And there was also a delivery management uh, group uh, that was chosen from the business side to take care of the planning and the delivery uh, for specific customers, because there was more and more work, also administrative work. And here we have 170 people already. And we were, by the end of the year, we were merged with smaller sub-related product uh, to our solution. And also we got new customers. So right now uh, we have almost uh, like 95% of the DSO market in Denmark, which is quite big success for us. But we also have 20 Scrum teams, six enabling teams, because right now the Shell team became a Scrum team and uh, um, their place in the enabling teams took the integration team, which is helping with the uh, integrations to external systems, external Danish systems. And um, well, as you can see, even those enabler teams, they come and go whenever they are needed. We are trying to be as responsive to the situation as we can. And we have another question. Thank you. Yes, please. I'm, I'm trying to understand why you have a separate delivery team to plan when you've got scrum teams, do they not do their own planning or is that a, a different level of planning? Yes, that's a different level of planning. And I will actually later on show exact examples of boards and visualizations we use. So you will be able to see those different levels. Um, the, the delivery management group is actually planning uh, like on this, you know, which customer when and <laughs> what we, which contract when and which MVP when and which model, how to, you know, put it on the top timeline uh, and the scrum teams are then uh, working on the goals that were set to them to make it possible. And so this delivery management team is setting the goals basically. Okay, so uh, a little bit, this is, I promise you, this is the last part of this uh, theoretical introduction to our context. <laughs> Later on will be only case study examples. So uh, when we look at the uh, process metrics we use, um, 
the most important two for me right now, when we have such big uh, load of work, uh, are time to market and predictability. For the Scrum teams, uh, as the time to market metric, we use the velocity. And to have the predictability of this velocity, we look at the minimum and maximum value of this velocity and also how it changes. When we say about uh, how is our time to market for the Kanban teams, uh, then we are measuring, measuring the lead time and the predictability is, of course, the lead time distribution, where we can see what is the deviation and uh, how the percentiles of the lead times look like uh, in our case. So this is the example of the Power BI dashboard. I love, uh, I love Power BI and I love data visualization. So uh, there will be a little bit of product placement right now for the Power BI. Maybe I should get paid for it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, what we can see here is that uh, I, I made uh, some filters to begin with. We can choose which team we would like to see. Uh, we can choose uh, which iterations we would like to take a look at, if it's past 12 iterations, 9 iterations, 6 iterations. And we also have uh, units, uh, story points or number of user stories. So we can choose whatever unit we would like to observe. We have some instructions how to use the report uh, because this is publicly open report to our entire setup, to, to every person in our product. So they need to know how to understand it. Mm, and then uh, we have some statistics and, of course, deviations and rolling average of the velocity. Uh, those reports are quite useful. Uh, what you can see at the middle of the top is the GAUG uh, that uh, shows you like your current sprint, how many story points or user stories you have versus your average velocity. So we usually saw the tendency to over planning in the Scrum teams. <laughs> um, but yeah, this was also actually very helpful for the sprint retrospectives to talk to the team about the way we plan. And those uh, are the metrics and this is the dashboard for Kanban teams uh, that we are using. So yet again, we can choose the team. And as you can see on this uh, team filter, we also see Scrum teams. Those team nine, eight uh, number teams are the Scrum teams. So we also can see the lead time distribution for our Scrum teams. And um, that might be also quite interesting. And some Scrum masters are actually actively using those reports as well. We can choose work item type, uh, we can choose the time frame, and we can see at the top the lead time distribution. On the right side of the lead time distribution, we already have counted the median and 85th percentile. Uh, so when the customer comes and asking when it will be done, we can just say, well, between one and seven days. Um, and we are quite certain. <laughs> and uh, then at the bottom, we have the total number of items with uh, exact percentiles for each value and full list of completed work items that are taken into the report. Question. Thank you. Um, how are you getting the data into Power BI? Is it coming from a, a, like a, a project management software tool? Yes, it's out of the box solution. Thank you. We are actually using the Microsoft stack uh, as KMD is the Microsoft partner, something, something, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we have this tooling. <laughs> But yeah, Power BI is awesome. But if you don't have Power BI, you can also use Excel. In my previous company, I didn't have Power BI license uh, at work. So I did similar charts in Excel. It's also possible. It's actually quite easy to do the histograms in Excel. You can uh, export the data from, you know, whatever tool you are using and just put it to Excel and make it draw a chart. Those are some additional process metrics. Uh, we are using for other things, like, for example, the system efficiency. Uh, this is something I uh, came up with 
pretty much recently because I believe it was like four or five months ago, something like that. And uh, I really like this view on this dashboard where we can actually compare how much item uh, was created for the past 30 days and how much items were delivered for the past 30 days. So, you know, if we have this backlog rising or not, I know that the cumulative flow diagram on the top left is actually showing that already, but those numbers are, you know, more precise. I like numbers. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm a physicist by education, so probably that's why. Um, we also have this summary report for the lead time distribution that you can see on the um, uh, bottom left corner, where we are comparing the bigger uh, amount of data, which is basically since the beginning we started gathering data, uh, and what was the percentiles, the values of the percentiles uh, of work items, lead times then, and we compare it to the last six weeks. So we can see the tendency if we are actually getting better or worse than before. And we also have some like outliers marked red if there is anything longer than should be. <laughs> <laughs> and current score, uh, scope burn up, uh, so we can also monitor progress on this big uh, entire product level. And that's the end of this theoretical intro to the context of KMD elements. Right now, I will jump to the examples of Kanban practices we used in specific teams. And uh, I would like to warn you, because during the next part of the presentation, there will be three statements my statements that might be quite controversial <laughs> because, well, they are definitely not popular. So I really am counting on you that we will discuss them uh, after the presentation because I really would like to know your opinion if you agree with me or not. So let's just jump a to of it. Questions, Eva, before you kick off. Yeah. Just got a couple questions. The first one, Evangelo just wants to know what do you mean the difference between resolved versus closed? Okay, so uh, resolve uh, are the ones that are closed in the downstream, like from the delivery team level. Like when, when they developed something, they resolve it, that's it. And only when the business, the customer will like take it, accept it, then it is closed. So that's the difference. There is sometimes a waiting time between resolved and closed when we are waiting for some feedback or something like that. Perfect. And your other question is, are these metrics per team or across all of the teams? Uh, those are actually per, well, that depends. Uh, the current scope burn up is across all of the teams, uh, the, but the scrum teams only because it counts the features. So it's even not team related. It's like the entire product backlog related. Uh, system efficiency, this is per team. Um, then this lead time changes outliers. We have the filter on the left side where we have to choose specific team because in my opinion, well, grouping the teams to come to look at the lead time distribution would not be the best idea. Uh, so yeah, maybe you can specify the question, which metric exactly. It didn't say, but I think that's good enough. Okay. <laughs> Mike, you've got a question? Yeah, I'm just curious about system efficiency. So, mm -hmm. one, I mean, it's the first time you brought it up. I thought to myself, how how do you analyze that? Because if you're getting epics coming in, for example, in the front door, and then you're saying how many stories you've delivered in the back door, then that would be very difficult to compare apples with apples, right? But yeah. I think if you're saying it's per team and you're saying features, then you're saying it's features that come in versus features that get completed. Is that my understanding? And uh, once again, that depends. Um, mm -hmm. Because on the feature level, mo everything that is delivered by the Scrum teams uh, is on, it's like for the business, it's viable on the feature level. So Scrum teams are also planning on the feature level, uh, not on the user story level, and they are trying to deliver features. And this is our like basic value added. However, uh, those operational teams who are using Kanban and who are using those system efficiency dashboards, uh, they are responding to requests that come from the Scrum teams. They are not part of the product features development directly. Sometimes they have some user stories under the feature if they have to deliver something for Scrum teams to this feature. Uh, but they 
do not own those features. So for example, the system efficiency is based on the user stories because the user stories are the level where the work is flowing for those teams. Okay, and then just on that, you talked about the delivery team. If the delivery team is there and they get wind of a feature from that's requested by a client, and then there's some lag time before a team finds out, does your system efficiency lead time start from the point at which a team finds out or when the organization gets a request from a customer? Mm, well, uh, the clock for the Kanban teams is whenever the request is prioritized and accepted that will be taken. Okay. So uh, when it comes, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be done. It's just one of the options. Uh, however, when the request comes uh, strictly from the customer, because, for example, something is not working on the production on the customer side, uh, or something was not migrated properly by the migration team, uh, then this is treated like, you know, like the urgent expedite, but that's the... Yeah. Um, Thank you. Regular approach. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Can I move on? <laughs> I'm so happy that you are so engaged in conversation with me. Okay, let's move on. So now for this hard uh, sentences, uh, I hope you won't, you know, kill me for it. Uh, I left the team alone, equipped with tools. And tools, I mean Kanban training and showing them how to run a flow review session, for example, how to improve, uh, how Kanban practices can help them with different things, what they are for, how to use them, things like that. And guess what? They are doing fine. <laughs> Looks like Kanban coach is not needed anymore. Uh, no, just joking. Uh, however, yeah, uh, I have a couple of examples that I will share with, uh, with you right now of the teams that... Uh, actually after the training and some one two meetings had uh, zero help from the scrum master or um, kanban um, coach site and even though they were able to do improvements by themselves if you thought that my previous slides were hard to read get prepared for even worse <laughs> because right now you should take your glasses because there will be a real board example with really small letters so this is it. And uh, what you can see here uh, is the architect's team. Architect's team is such a funny example because I started working with architect's team uh, at the very, very, very beginning of my Kanban journey in KMD. So the same time when I started with platform team, which is the, the end of 2022. But uh, I worked with architects, I did the static workshops with them to map their system, to uh, think about the requests they've got, many different stuff they do. They were constantly overwhelmed, they were constantly interrupted, not enough architects for the amount of uh, scrum teams that needed their help and advice. Uh, and, uh, you know, I tried to help them get a little bit order in this chaos. Uh, however, it was really tough. We were able to create uh, some sort of board with visualization, but uh, very soon they stopped using it, which means they were registering on the board like half of their work at best, because most of their work was hidden in the uh, Microsoft Teams conversations, where people were just asking directly on the chat specific team members for specific things and expected immediate answer and things like that and architects were used to it, so they didn't really want it to change. They were like, no, when developer asks me, I will just answer. I don't want to make it a big process. Uh, but then they didn't have any time to do the actual architectural tasks they had. So um, the biggest challenge was to just you know, know what they are doing. And due to many different reasons, including changes uh, in the organization structure, my priorities, capacity, different stuff, um, I didn't support this team further. Um, uh, they were left alone for more than a year. And actually, a couple of year, uh, days ago, I decided to 
while preparing this presentation, I decided to take a look at their board. I was like, hmm, let's see what architects are doing right now. How this uh, Kanban that in my mind was dying in their team, how, how is it working? And I was really surprised to see that they are actually improved because, for example, what you see here is the uh, work monitoring, work registration on the feature level. So when I was working with them, they were uh, constantly talking on the lower level, this user story level, single re requests level. And it was too much, uh, I don't know, too, too much administrative effort to, to keep it all up to date. And right now they switched to the feature level to have like the bigger chunks of work uh, observed and it's working much better for them. They created swim lanes based on the uh, categories of work they have to create visibility on how much capacity is being used on different levels. Uh, as you can see, those uh, whip limits are actually uh, automatic. I don't believe they put the five number on purpose because this is the standard number that appears uh, by default <laughs> when you create a new board. Uh, however, uh, what we have on this board, like I, I don't care about whip limits right now because what I care about is that they are actually visualizing what they are doing. One year after the training with me, after getting to know Kanban practices or even more right now, a year and a half, they are able to organize their work by themselves and use those tools to actually get a grip of what they are working on. And we have a question. Mike? Yeah, thank you. Um, so you've got Scrum teams that are using Velocity and Scrum and Story Points. Yes. Hopefully, they're using Velocity to try and be predictive about when they're going to finish that. Sometimes they're assisted by architects because they might be doing a new piece of work, so they need some new architecture. But the architects are now putting their work on this board as that won't be, I assume, as that wouldn't be absorbed within the velocity of the team, is there any concern that you have that that lowers their predictability in future? Because it's it's not, it's when they look at their board, they're not able to see a, a predictive velocity um, for a group of stories, which they might say is a feature or an epic even more broadly. Unless you put links between this board and that board, which would then allow you to do sort of an outer join, which which would give you a holistic totaling. Yes, whatever they are uh, dependencies between work items uh, and especially between uh, work items of different teams, we are linking them as the linked, related, predecessor, blocker, whatever the relation is. Okay, that's great, thank you. Yes, however, what you mentioned there, um, it's uh, really close to the process we have for creating new microservices, which is called high-level design uh, uh, acceptance process, <laughs> where the Scrum team is basically designing the architecture of the new microservice, uh, creating the required documentation, filling the required fields. They have the template provided by the architects, and they have to justify their solution, uh, why and how they would like to introduce uh, this microservice to the system. And uh, then architects need to approve it uh, if it works okay with the rest of the product. If there are some doubts, then there are additional meetings and clarifications. But uh, yeah, this is basically how it looks like. So yeah, those work items that are dependent on high level design, uh, Scrum teams already know that they will need additional time for consultations with architects. So it's also included somewhat in their planning. Yeah, that sounds very reasonable. I wonder just, um... There's another question that is quite similar in the chat. I'll just ask it. So, uh, Yasmina asks, what is the difference between user story level and feature level? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question because the answer is that depends on the team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I love how inconsistent it is in our product, and that's ironic, uh, love, because uh, for Scrum teams, it's quite easy to understand because we have uh, goals that the couple of Scrum teams might be working on together, or even one Scrum team might be working on one goal. There, there is no the rule that depends on the 
size of the customer process if it requires one team domain and knowledge or more. So we have this goal level. Under the goals, we have the feature level. So we have different features assigned to different teams that will contribute to this goal. And under these features, each team is actually planning their work for the iteration using the user stories, which are the like uh, simple requirements, um, simple, small requirements. Features are like bigger groups of requirements implemented together to provide some some value for the customer, some concrete bigger value for the customer. Because actually user stories also provide some value for the customer. That's more complicated than I thought it would be when I listen to myself right now. <laughs> uh, however, uh, yeah, so the, the Scrum teams are working on the daily basis on the user stories. However, they also do uh, bigger planning every two months on the feature level sort of like PI planning, but not exactly. Uh, and then uh, we have those goals that they cooperate together uh, in different groups. And when we talk about the Kanban teams, those enabler teams, they uh, have a little bit different situation um, because the features in those teams are usually the names of uh, bigger endeavors. Like for example, performance tests or security tests for some specific situation that was in the contract described and we need to perform it before the go live date. So um, when we have such bigger effort uh, that will require more than one team or basically the entire setup to do something, uh, then it would be a feature for those operational teams. Uh, however, all the requests they get, um, like the tickets they, that comes to them from Scrum teams, from uh, business, from many different sites, uh, those are the user stories. So those are those tickets for operational teams. Okay. Do I see another question or? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, you mentioned customer process, and I thought I knew what that meant, but I'm not familiar with that terminology. Mm -hmm. um, well. If our solution is basically an uh, automated way to calculate uh, the settlements and contracts for the energy providers, uh, then that means that we have a lot of different data points that uh, need to be calculated via specific um, price tariffs to you know, know how much you need to build the customer or the company or whoever you are pricing for the energy. And uh, well, uh, because of that, uh, we um, are actually having some set processes, um, behaviors of our customers that needs to be automated. Is this B two B then, not B two C? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. I see. Okay, now it's starting to make sense. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we are actually creating the solution for the energy providers and uh, gotcha. companies that are. Yeah, uh, taking care of distribution of the energy and calculations of, uh, and the billing. Hmm? Okay, I will move on. Okay, yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I I thought I will have not enough slides to take uh, enough time, but right now I'm afraid I will not make it. Okay, so um, extra transform load ETL team case study. Uh, Extract transform load, this is the ETL, so the migration team. They are taking the data from the customer, from their old system, and they are migrating this data to our new, fresh, beautiful KMD elements. And uh, how they work? Well, uh, before Kanban training, <laughs> so in January this year, this was the situation they usually had. So um, those percentile values, like seven to 31 days uh, and this really long tail, that was the usual, right? So like the standard situation and around 18 items in between 15 and 20, something like that. In February, they attended the Kanban training, entire team attended the Kanban training and they designed their Kanban system. So they were basically using static and uh, Kanban method to create their visualization, adding with limits, taking care of feedback loops, all those stuff. They were able to complete more and they were able to cut off their long tail. So that's nice. 
But look what happened in March when they had entire month of data on the new WIP limits without any leftovers. Da, 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 da. When I actually uh, showed those results for the first time to the team and their manager, they were really happy and they were like, wow, we're so awesome. We're so great. We're so improving. One to seven days. That's awesome. It's, you know, 41 days, 85th percentile and now seven days. We are so great. And you know what? They are. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I didn't have to take their hand and do everything for them. I just needed to explain them how things work. And actually, uh, maybe I'm a little bit biased as a Kanban trainer, but Kanban is quite simple and logic to understand. So if you have intelligent people like software developers, they actually don't need much more than to understand how it works. Um, this is their board right now. A little bit different than the initial board design, but this is very common, at least in my teams, when we implement Kanban, that static shows a different design than we actually have in the end, or that this design is changing all the time. Um, what we can see here is also that I brought uh, the standard swim lane um, a little bit bigger uh, under the, the board so that you could see what issue right now the team has. Uh, can you see it? We have 20 new swim lane, which is the batch that came to migration with the fixed date that needs to be taken care of. We have six in the refinement for the standard tickets and only two in the development and one in further stages. So definitely some upstream issues right now and we need to take care of that. What uh, other conclusions uh, were, uh, well, visibility of aging helped us with external work prioritization. So when the team had issues like the business is not taking, uh, giving feedback and taking like the, you know, accept, accepting the delivered work um, and it was aging on the board, it was very visible and it was really easy to escalate that it has the priority. Uh, limiting work in progress helps visualize the team's capacity and thanks to that, it helped them increase the focus and need for better prioritization because very soon they found out that they have more work than they are able to deliver, so they need to prioritize better. And that also led to better refinements. And we, when we have better preparation, better prioritization, then in the end, we also have better results as we saw on the previous slide. And even if the work is being pushed on the team because they have fixed date migration and the batch of tasks is just, you know, you need to migrate this set of data, pff, bam, this is your work. Even if uh, it is hold in this options backlog list, whatever you call it, and it's not being prioritized and planned and refined and analyzed and whatever until the team has capacity for it. This is how it looks like today. So as you can see, the results from March uh, where actually the team was able to keep them more or less. We can see one outlier right now that has more than 50 days on this histogram, but uh, Yep, basically the, the values didn't change much. Uh, so the team is quite stable uh, and they are actually able to deliver more or less the same amount of item that is being created. So that's also good. And the last example of the team that I uh, only taught but not helped very much with Kanban is the multi-level shared service uh, CR team case. Uh, CR team is really funny team because this is the Scrum team that was created recently uh, to implement the change requests from existing customers. Mm, because right now, uh, most of our Scrum teams are pretty much uh, focused on delivering new functionalities for the new customers because the big go live date is coming. Uh, so, uh, the management decided to create a separate scrum team for from the people inside our setup. They were taken from different teams, like whoever wanted to do it, the volunteers. And they created small team because it has like three developers and one tester, uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe four. Uh, and the small team is doing the change requests for existing customers. And they are basically, you know, touching domains of each scrum team. So they have uh, close cooperations with many different scrum teams. And they are doing Kanban. And uh, what they found out after the training was that uh, swim lanes per class of service that they designed on the Team Kanban practitioner classes was 
actually not so good for them. And the better approach was that they changed it for swim lanes per customer so that they knew which Scrum team is actually ordering some change in their domain for existing customer. And uh, thanks to that, they were, they were able to show the aging items uh, and to escalate the priority to take care of them. Because, you know, when you have external dependencies, uh, I found out in KMD that with external dependencies, the easiest way to take care of them is to visualize the aging uh, of the item and then show it to the relevant people and the priority will rise. <laughs> yeah, question? Thank you. With with so many Scrum teams that you had there, or, or is this specifically for the Kanban teams that we're talking about? Yes, it's specifically for the Kanban teams that we're talking about. And right now I'm talking specifically about this uh, specific team. Uh, and e even though they are uh, working with Scrum teams and delivering features, so they could be working in Scrum, uh, they are working in Kanban. Uh, due to many different reasons uh, but uh, yeah for example like they really wanted to <laughs> and if they have different scrum teams to take care of they have different sources for, of requirements and the change request from the customers also comes and goes so uh, it, it was easier for them to to handle it that way thank you the reason why i'm asking is because i was wondering why the customers were in swim lanes why weren't there dedicated teams per customer and i guess it's because there's a you've got a knowledge uh, within yes. the team and it's shared across multiple customers. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Okay, so statement number two. <clears throat> I started Kanban without whip limits. That's fine. I let the team grow and improve in their own pace. An example for that is the multi-level shared service, which is Q18 case. And this is answering the one of the first questions about the QA team. So when we did, did static with the QA team, we started with issues. Um, and then, of course, how we can address these issues using Kanban practices. The team, I don't know if you can read those letters. Sorry, they are smaller than I thought. Um, Actually, the team never mentioned WIP limit as the solution to their issues, other than uh, minimum WIP limit for the refinement that it should be minimum one so that the system will not starve. That was it. So uh, if the team initially didn't find the need to use whip limits to solve their issues, I didn't uh, found the need to push it to them. So like, OK, maybe later, no problem. Um, that was the initial board design that they did. They had active and passive columns. Uh, the board right now looks a little bit different. It changed over time, of course. Uh, and they were splitting the swim lanes per class of service. And actually, when it comes to the visualization in our tooling in Azure DevOps, we have a full flow visualization on the higher level, on the, well, features like initiative level uh, for the management and QA team manager. And then we, from those features from this first board, we have user stories underneath that are like a checkboxes, and they are actually also visible on two different boards. Why two different boards? Because, uh, well, QA team works closely also with uh, Scrum teams and is answering their requests, and Scrum teams testers are also working together and helping each other in so-called QA community. So when the QA team, for example, is um, starting the initiative on the feature level, that will be, I don't know, stress tests. We will do some stress test uh, performance uh, uh, to see uh, it, how we handle this and that amount of data users, whatever. And right now, in order to perform this feature, to complete it, we would need the QA team members, so this supporting team, to prepare, for example, environment, prepare some test data, uh, do a couple of different stuff, coordinate the effort. And on the QA community board, on the other hand, uh, there, they, ah, there would be tasks visualized about, for example, uh, preparing test cases that should be run in each team's domain to cover this uh, initiative, stuff like that. So the QA community board is for the Scrum team testers, 
and the Q18 board on the stories level is from the Q18. And then we also have this view on the higher level, on the feature level, which is like the bigger initiatives uh, on this QA side. I hope it's a, at least a little clear because when I listen to myself, I can see how well complex it is. <laughs> uh, OK, so running further. That was the beginning of the QA team. Uh, we had month to month a little bit of issues, uh, as you can see, because new requests created were like twice as much than the uh, items we were able to complete. Uh, even though in the meantime, the number of people changed, a lot of things changed. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look good, right? And But that was just the start. And then we had the moment of urgent or won't do. We can see here. Yeah, question to the previous slide. Is it right if we just hold the questions? It's just I'm conscious of time. It's half seven when we're at sure. time. Of yeah. course, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Thank you. Because I've got, I've got a quarter to eight drop dead, just to let you know, Eva, OK? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> OK, uh, so uh, urgent or won't do moment. That was an interesting moment. As you can see, uh, around 5th of March, QA team stopped doing standard items and did only urgent items, which is uh, very clearly visible on those charts. <laughs> I, I love them so much. Like we, we stopped and then we start doing only expedite. Uh, well, not so good, right? Uh, so um, here, no more progress here, only urgent stuff. So that was like the first time I asked the team, don't we lack whip limits? Maybe we could, you know, take care of our capacity uh, split. And this is how it looks like today. So this is the team that was not abandoned by me. <laughs> I was supporting them on daily basis and I still uh, help them. And right now we are in the situation like that. So uh, of course it could be better. Of course the metrics could be improved, but at least we have active and passive columns on our board uh, with the visualization. We have some whip limit, although even on the screenshot it is overreached, but it is there. And uh, at least we have good visualization and starting to do something about about the issues we have. And uh, yeah, I think we are getting better and better. Hopefully in half a year from now, the results will be even, you know, more spectacular. Last sentence, other workflows and services. Well, any process can be better with Kanban practices. So other places we use Kanban, whole setup board. And this is this delivery management group. When I just told uh, you that the delivery team is also sort of Kanban team, uh, well, they are not Scrum team and they are using some Kanban practices. So that's why they are Kanban team <laughs> in my head. And they are, for example, using this visualization uh, where each team is on the different swim lane on the feature level, we can expand each team to see the features progress, if they are in progress, done, what is the state, and we can compare them between teams. We also see the dependencies there. There is like the, the, the specific symbol when there is a de dependency or a blocker. So uh, that view is actually on the timeline uh, because that's the, this axis is the timeline. We can see what is going on in each iteration in each team. We also use the uh, use Kanban for risk management. Uh, we use Kanban cards. We also have the Kanban board for the risk management, where we are uh, describing not only where the risk is, what the risk is about, but also what would be the impact and consequence of such risk. And when we escalate those risks, this is our uh, triangle of escalation. So uh, we have the daily Scrum in each Scrum team. Right. So every day they meet in the morning and for 15 minutes, if they have any risks, blockers that should be addressed, uh, they should actually mention it on this meeting. Then uh, representatives from Scrum teams are meeting inside their bubbles dailies. Yeah, so we have this goals, customer process focus, and then we have the second level daily inside those forums, those groups. And uh, then we discuss the risks that can be escalated on this level, cross team level inside one of the group. And if the risk cannot be taken care of on this level, it is escalated even higher. So there is another daily meeting, another 15 minutes for the delivery management and managers level where uh, 
basically the assumption is that if any risk is risen by the scrum team in the morning, then one hour later on the uh, highest level daily, it is addressed by the management. So this is this fast uh, risk escalation path we are using. And the last one, uh, onboarding with visualization board. I mentioned before that we had a time when we had to onboard a lot of new people, entire teams together and well, a lot of people at the same time. So um, we also had to establish and improve our onboarding process. It changed a couple of times during that time. Right now it looks like this and we have the visualization board for it. We have the clear policies, so exit criteria for each column, each in onboarding step. We have the template work item with the checkpoints, uh, with, which is the checklist with tasks that uh, needs to be done. Uh, we can see the number of items in each column, and that's, that's good enough to take care of who is onboarded where. As you can see, the swim lanes are um, three different categories. The first one is the first product. The second one is the smaller second product that was merged to us. And the last one is both. So like people who will be working on the entire uh, setup. Yeah, as in the big setup, we have a lot of different levels. Okay, what I've learned. Patience and trust. That is like the, the basic thing I learned, not only from my cat when I was training her to do the high five, but also from my teams and from working with Kanban, uh, that evolutionary change will give you nice results, but you have to wait. Yeah. Teaching and tools, this is really important. Um, a lot of people we work with, especially in software development, are really smart people. Just explain to them what it will give them, what benefits they can expect, how to use uh, Kanban tools techniques. They will grab it and love it. Communication. That's quite obvious, but when we are talking about the setup where we have around, you know, 250 people working on one product together, then without the communication, it is just impossible to move forward. Uh, it's impossible to not be blocked. So we need to communicate on a daily basis. That sounds like we already heard that before, right? <laughs> I mean, even when I was writing this slide, I was like, hmm, it's kind of similar to like, I don't know, Agile Manifesto <laughs> or any, you know, management 3.0 techniques and approaches. It's like what modern ways of management are all about. And uh, I believe that Kanban is no different here. Okay, so that would be it. Unless there are any questions waiting in the queue. And if not, then I would like to hear your opinion about my statements. So let's just give Eva a round of applause for her talk. So we've got five Thank minutes. You. We've got five minutes for questions. Uh, so uh, hands up if you've got any questions for Eva, and then we'll get through them as, as quick as we can. Yeah. Fire away with your question. Hi, Eva. Thank you so much for um, the presentation. Just out of curiosity, how did the team respond to a very metric-driven method of Kanban? Mm -hmm. um, they actually like it because those metrics usually help them resolve the issues that they had no proof of before. Like, for example, aging items because they were waiting for external uh, blockers uh, or um, things that they have not enough capacity to handle all their requests, things like that. So uh, those metrics are basically the knight in the shining armor for the teams <laughs> because they give them the tools to have the proof that, well, their issues are real. Uh, Fernando is interested in seeing the free controversial statements again. Um, and while you're looking for those, um, there was another question in there from Maru, which is how does prioritizing work then if they have customer lanes instead of classes of service? Let me come back to the board which we are talking about because we this was to oh, yeah this was about this one right yeah 
and the prioritization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, they are prioritizing based on the first in, first out. So they are just responding to the requests because this is all a request from the existing customers from the production. So when the product owner of specific Scrum team is coming to this team and saying, hey, uh, the customer wants to the change in our domain. However, my team is doing new functionalities right now. So this change request has to be done by you guys from CR team. And then it lands in the appropriate swim lane. And whenever its turn appears, they take it according to implements. Perfect. Thank you. And if you could just reiterate for us what your three controversial statements were. One of them was you didn't start with WIP. Shock, horror. Yeah. What were the other two? Yeah. Uh, one was that Kanban can improve any processes, uh, whatever they are. And the, the first one was that I left the team with tools alone and they are doing fine without the constant assistance of a Scrum Master or a Kanban coach. Okay, Mike, next question. Keep it succinct. Yeah, just wondering whether you guys allow teams to see customer satisfaction of the things that they actually deliver. Yeah, actually, we also let developers to meet with our customers, maybe not on a regular basis, but we had uh, some sort of, sort of workshop, blah, workshops with the uh, requirements clarifications where our developers were also present from the Scrum teams. Uh, we also uh, include developers in um, demo presentations for the customers uh, whenever the new set of functionalities is being delivered for them. Uh, and they listen to the feedback, although they listen to it in Dan Danish. So uh, that's, not <laughs> that's not really understandable for them for now, but uh, because all of those meetings are uh, actually in Danish because we are on a Danish market. Uh, but yeah, our Polish developers are there uh, included. So at least partially they are in contact with the customer so they can even talk about their pains. An unfortunately low number of companies actually do that. So well done. It would be easier if you could all speak Danish, but it's not an easy language. Believe me, I tried. <laughs> Omar, question. Thank you. Um, I didn't understand the, the, the QA, the three sets of QA. Is is one of them like a, a chapter to, to, uh, to them to, in terms of like, do they... Do they govern best practice? And so, yeah, just a bit more clarity on that, please. Mm -hmm. Sure. OK, so uh, what we see here on this um, feature level QA team is basically what uh, QA test manager, uh, head of quality assurance and release manager are looking at. And they are planning the wider initiatives. Like, for example, security test before the audit or, uh, um, I don't know, some report preparation for audit purposes, because we have audits twice a year. We, we are a validated product uh, or um, I don't know. Right now, I only can think about the security and performance test because this is currently on our plate. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, so sometimes things like, for example, tooling for the uh, automation test suit we have. Yeah. Uh, so like improvements or the framework improvements, things like that. And then to make it happen. Uh, so this feature level is like the goal level, the initiative level. And then to make it happen, uh, some work will be done by the QA team members which are uh, not in the Scrum teams. They are just supporting all of the Scrum teams by doing additional things that doesn't belong to anyone when we are working in such a big product split for domains in the Scrum teams. Uh, so there are some areas in the middle that no one takes care of. So this is where the QA team steps in to, to do those tests. And uh, there is this QA community level where all the testers from the Scrum teams, so the ones that are implementing new features, the ones that are creating new product, are working together to make something happen. So, for example, when we have this big endeavor that includes all of the testers that they need to do something together to perform tests on the product level, then each tester from the Scrum team has a task on QA community board for their domain from their Scrum team. 
And the QA team has tasks to coordinate it, plan it, and create reports after that and things like that. Okay, thank you. Perfect. And final question of the day comes from me. Thinking about with your time with these teams, what mistake or what one thing, if you had your time to do it again, what would you do differently? Hmm. That's a really good question because there are a lot of things I would like to do differently right now. Uh, I think that actually I could try to do more with the architects team. I feel like uh, abandoning them was a little bit like, oh, okay, it's not working so well. I have other teams who would like to start Kanban, so maybe I can just, you know, yeah focus on them <laughs> and that was not very ah, nice of me and i think i could do much more uh, with this team to help them better however when i recently saw that they took care of themselves and they are doing actually not so bad uh well maybe it wasn't so bad after all 